Let's face it, in our busy lives, we don't eat enough fruits and vegetables. In fact, according to the CDC, only 1 in 10 Americans are eating the recommended daily amount of fruits and vegetables each day, missing out on essential vitamins, minerals, fibers, and antioxidants. And that's where Balance in Nature comes in. Balance in Nature sources only the best produce, free from pesticides, heavy metals, and harmful bacteria. And Balance in Nature is the best fruit and vegetable product on the market. They use only fresh, whole fruits and vegetables inside each capsule. They don't use any GMOs, fillers, binding agents, or preservatives of any kind. You're getting real food, real science, real nutrition. I would never endorse a product that I don't use myself. And since using Balance in Nature, I feel more alert. I have more energy. My focus is sharper, and I feel great. Live life to the fullest and choose Balance in Nature. And guess what? PAS Report listeners can get 35% off the first preferred order. Start getting the recommended daily amount of fruits and vegetables you need by using code PAS at balanceofnature.com. Welcome to the PAS Report Weekly Roundup Podcast. The PAS Report provides an honest analysis on the critical issues that matter to you without the biased media filter. Here's your host, Professor Nicholas Giordano. What's up, everyone? Welcome to the PAS Report Podcast. This is your host, Nick Giordano. Have another special bonus episode here because we've witnessed a hostile takeover of the urban areas throughout the country. We're seeing this socialist push over the last several years, and many of the areas that were already suffering. They're worse off today than they've ever been. It's why we need real leadership to take back these areas. And sadly, the Republican Party as a whole has abandoned and surrendered uh, a lot of these areas that exist. But we are witnessing a massive grassroots push by ordinary Americans, ordinary people that are just sick and tired. They're fed up at what they're seeing. You got people like Curtis Sliwa, who's running for New York City mayor. You got Vicky Palladino, Council District 19, Tom Zimich for Queensborough president. And I'm bringing in Marvin Jeffcoat for Council District 26. He is a guy that has served our country with honor and distinction in the United States military, someone that's a productive member of society, He's someone that truly cares, and he's sick and tired of what he's seeing going on in his community. So he's running for Council District 26, and it really is extraordinary. We're seeing so many new faces that are rising up. They're looking to take back the urban centers. You know, the other day I had on Billy Prempe, who's running for Congress next year, and Marvin is just a, he's a fascinating individual. Before I bring in Marvin, make sure you go to the PASReport.com, sign up for the newsletter, follow the podcast, share the episode, and don't forget to write a review for the PAS Report. It always helps us in the rankings. With that out of the way, I want to bring in Marvin Jeffcoat, running for New York City Council District 26. Marvin, so glad you could be here. How are you today? I'm doing fine, and I hope you're doing well as well. I am. I mean, I could complain, but nobody listens. Nobody cares. Yeah. Actually, I do it all the time. So not in but, City Hall, anyways. Yeah, right. Not in New, not in, throughout New York and a lot of places. Even the federal administration. That's a complete disaster. I wanted to bring you in because I wanted to talk about. You know, I think New York City is like a microcosm for the rest of the country. And as we see New York City continue to decline and deteriorate. I think it speaks to the country also declining. So you're someone, what have you seen over the last several years in in New York that propelled you, an ordinary American, take a stand, show leadership, and try and turn things around? Well, I've seen things get progressively worse. You know, I ran four years ago and I talked about the same issues and they've been exacerbated. Instead of concentrating on fixing things, you know, my opponent at the time, Jimmy Van Bramer, he led demonstrations across the Queensboro Bridge against the police department. Now they've totally besmirched, besmirched the police department's reputation. They scapegoat the police department. You have a guy running for mayor who's a former police captain, and he won't stand up and say, hey, stop scapegoating the best police department in the world. Now, every police department has you know, less than 1% of bad apples. But by and large, we have great men and, uh, men and women made up of fellow New Yorkers from all walks of life. It's a majority minority police department. And just like when I joined the Army, these people... They joined the police department to serve their fellow citizens and to protect them. And and they're not getting the credit that they deserve because, you know, the media focuses attention on the one or two bad apples and they just blow it out of proportion. So, you know, instead of being able to talk about my platform, not only for public safety, but for education and wealth creation, I got to put the emphasis on our safe streets. We saw a whole summer of riots created by the Democrat socialists designed to make us miserable and fearful and more dependent on the government. And, and, you know, so those are the things that I want to get rid of. This is not the America my parents gave me. 
and I don't want to leave my kids this mess. No, definitely not. And as far as your platform goes, your your opponent is like pretty much an open socialist, if you ask me. <laughs> and, she is, but I get criticized for calling her a socialist. Well, that's the amazing part. You can't call them. Well, the word the left is very good at controlling the narratives, and they're very good at language and terminology. But that's exactly what's been done in New York City. We we've seen it move towards a socialist push, and. We've seen the education system is worse than it's ever been. We had this disaster of a bail reform bill that all it did was release criminals like career criminals back into the communities that they've already victimized. And it seems that most of the leaders, whether it's New York City Council, whether it's the mayor's office, whether it's the state of New York, are out of touch with the communities. Now, my, I also have issues with Republicans because they've abandoned these areas. Mm-hmm. What do you see happening as far as this race goes, are you getting Republican support or is this all grassroots? You are pounding the pavement. I know that Vicky Paladino, everyone's pounding the pavement. Are you getting any support from the Queens GOP? Well, I got the Queens GOP's endorsement, um, you know, and I appreciate it. But it's been uh, myself and, and some volunteers, uh, one lady, Fanny Calderon. Um, you know, I don't know if she wants me putting the name out there, but I got to say she's been phenomenal. She's been a great help. Um, you know, she's my director of communications on a voluntary basis. I've had help from people like Curtis and Vicky. Um, you know, they, they've nurtured me a little bit. But by and large, it's been uh, a one-man show, you know, one man working for all of us. And I just want to say, when, when you get this socialist machine going, you see not only the services decline, like the filth in our streets and the guys exposing themselves and engaging in public defecation and urination and aggressive panhandling, but you get unreasonable mandates, uh, you know, not just the vaccine mandate where they seize your body against the Fourth Amendment and tell you now that our school children have to have it. That's the that's the latest thing they're doing. They're, they're firing all city employees that won't take it. Um, but, you know, we have this 39th Avenue bike lane boulevard fiasco, and my opponent won't debate me in an open forum to talk about it. But the neighborhood is furious. After 12,000 residents along 39th Avenue, a fire department lieutenant and multiple schools and, and churches, except for the school that got brand new money for an auditorium or money for a brand new auditorium. Yeah, you know, you know how that works. They spoke out about it. The current councilman, Jimmy Van Bramer, looked the lieutenant in the eye because the lieutenant came up and said, I can't get my trucks around here. I can't provide the service. You know, we got a six minute response time. But when you put impediments in the way, like this, I don't know what, I don't even know what the call <laughs> is. You know, it, it's a mess. It's, it's a, a gaggle. And um, when you put that in the way, you decrease that response time, making, Creating a fire hazard and danger for the residents, Jimmy shook the guy's hand, looked him in the face and said, what you said is a game changer. I'm going to vote no to this bike lane. Lo and behold, they had a fundraiser for him two weeks later, I'm told by a reliable source, and he changed his vote to a yes. My opponent won't, my opponent won't speak out on it because, you know, she's a bike enthusiast, as she says on her website. And we can talk about a lot of the other loopy things that she opposes, but there should be rooms room for bicycles and pedestrians and vehicles, but it's got to be done in a smart way. Skillman Avenue, 39th Avenue, done in the dead of the night on Zoom where the older folks can't uh, weigh in on it and the the people that need it. And I have neighbors, friends over there whose kids almost got run over. That's not the right way to do things. And putting, you know, taking up an eight lane highway such as Queens Boulevard with bike lanes is just wrongheaded because what it does, when I'm on the bikes, don't obey the traffic law. So they create a hazard for themselves. They, some of them have been killed already. But it, it decreases the um, the amount of time that, or, or the, the rate of time that a, a delivery truck can safely navigate Queens Boulevard making this delivery. So now, if, uh, and people don't think like this, socialists definitely don't think this. No. But if I'm pre- my business is predicated on so many stops a minute, I got to charge you more because I'm not getting those stops. And I got to pay the driver the same amount of money. I got to pay, you know, and, and rightfully so. I got You got to give, you got to pay a decent salary and you got to take care of health benefits, right? So I got to factor all that in there, but I'm getting less productivity out of that driver. Not his fault. He's still doing the same thing he's always done, but he's got to slow down because you got bicycles on an eight lane highway. And oh, by the way, if the bikes don't obey the, the, the rule and they cut into the truck, the truck is going to get in trouble. They're going to blame him. So it's, you know, it's, it's wrongheaded and it's not done, but that's how socialists are. You know, when I was on a community board before my opponent, when I was on a community board about 10, 15 years ago, the Department of uh, Transportation's commissioner came down and said, we have to condition New Yorkers to use bicycles. We're going to get cars off the street. Who does that? That's not America. 
That's socialism. Yeah. That's that's a dictatorship. And once now that people like myself with a family of four that want to go to Costco's, I'm not going to be pulling a little red wagon or riding a bicycle with my groceries that are going to spoil in the summertime. So it's yeah. it's horrible. Well, the, the Democrats, they never look at the unintended consequences of the policies and another policy that's coming down the pike. And, and I want to make everyone aware it doesn't matter if you're in a red state or blue state in, in these blue urban areas. We saw California do this where they're trying to do away with single family housing. There's also proposals in New York City to do away with single family housing in, in all the areas. I mean, how would that impact the city as a whole if you do away with single family housing going forward? It's going to destroy the makeup of a neighborhood. You know, you have that 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 family style neighborhood where people know each other. And by and large, we get along regardless of race, color or creed. Um, and I, you know, I have that on my block. It's a nice, quiet block. You get to know your neighbors, but also you have to look at the infrastructure. All right. So when they come in there and they rezone it, they never take into account the sewer system, the domestic water supply, the electrical grid, and all those things are under service. Parking in the area is going to be atrocious because now you're going to have multiple and you're going to have people slowing up and idling and you're going to create more of the pollution that they say causes um, global warming, which they had to change the name of that to climate change. <laughs> The science didn't fit their narrative, um, you know, because like the economy, weather is cyclical, right? You know, it, it, it changes. Well, it's believe um, in science, but only the science that fits our narrative. That's exactly. the way they operate. Yeah, but it's going to be a disaster. It's going to, you know, Vicky talked about her uh, generational immigration in, into the country. Her, her parents, grandparents came here, hardworking people from Italy, and they built that neighborhood. And she's still in the original house, I believe. And, and you know, it's going to destroy that neighborhood atmosphere, and it's going to break up that culture that we have, that shared bond. But more more importantly, it's going to be a logistical or a, a utility nightmare because they don't plan ahead. They don't do city planning. And you're going to have, you're not going to have the cohesion of a neighborhood that you used to have. And they want to break that up. They said that they're going to relocate people into neighborhoods. Now, you know, I, it's not a racial issue. But hardworking people, middle class people work hard. They acquire property after generations. Sometimes it, it takes a little bit, but they deserve to have the comfort and peace. But when you have an influx of people that don't really care about the, the, the property that they're going to occupy, you know, if, if I'm a homeowner, I'm going to put the lid back on the trash can because I don't want rats and, and, and stray cats and stuff coming in and tearing up my trash. Some people and I'm not knocking everybody. And don't get me wrong. I, I grew up I grew up very hard the first few years of my life. So I know what it is to struggle. And that's not a bragging point, but that's just to say, I'm not attacking the poor. I've been there, all right? And the programs that I sponsor are designed to give the poor parity with me and others like Vicky that have worked so hard over the generations to acquire what we don't, we don't have a lot of wealth, but they want to take all of it. <laughs> so, you know, you're going to break all that up if you get rid of the single family dwelling. I mean, that's the family unit. It's designed to destroy the family unit but it's designed to displace us. So we won't know what New York looks like. It, we won't be able to recognize it. And again, they're not going to provide the services. And oh, by the way, police, fire, and uh, EMT services will have to increase too, because you're going to, it's going to create congestion because you put, this is, you know, when Moses designed Queens, he designed it so that it was kind of suburban. And, and you're going to replace all of that. You're going to overtax the grid. And you're going to create friction, all right? And when you create that kind of friction, your crime is going to increase because Let's face it, there's not going to be enough for everybody. No. And it's just going to be a disaster. And, and those with the means will end up leaving. And, and they're the ones, so the city will be bringing in less money. So it's a complete disaster all around. But let's talk about another disaster that they want to do, where they want to shut down most of the prisons in the city. I mean, oh. they, they want to just release these people into what? Halfway houses in the middle of communities. And we're not talking about, you know, the first-time offender that made a stupid mistake as a teenager, you know, as a young adult, we're talking about hardened criminals that they just want to release and put in halfway houses and do away with the prison system. And once again, the reason that everyone needs to pay attention is because New York City is a blueprint for what they want to do nationwide. And so how would it hurt your community if a place like Rikers Island gets shut down, even though that's going to hell too? Well, absolutely. They got to go somewhere, right? And they want to put them back in the neighborhood to re-victimize the people they've already victimized. And it's just insane. But what we need to look at is that in the process of closing Rikers Island, and they have brand new physical edifices that they could retrofit and renovate. Some of them are aging, but most, a lot of it is 
is new, and, and they just want to abandon it and, and, and close Rikers Island. And in the process, they've created an Eighth Amendment night and created a hardship for the correction officers and the inmates alone. What team suicides? I think I think some of those suicides are homicides. But what needs to happen to fix that? My plan, anyway, is to increase the amount. Well, number one, the overall criminal justice system is broke. You know, from intake through incarceration through reintegration. Uh, but you need to increase the correction officer to inmate ratio so that the correction officer controls the facility, not the inmate. When violence occurs, you can quickly quell it. You need specially trained uh, correction officers to recognize mental health. The same same with uh, your police officers to recognize mental health issues so that they can start a triage and, and the facility to do it. And, and you got to pay them more because they're doing more. And, and uh, so you treat the mentally ill, but also in the current conditions, that we have at Rikers Island, you can't rehabilitate anybody because either you become a predator or a victim, same as they do on the street, right? And under that mindset, you can't begin the rehabilitation. But once we establish some law and order inside the prison system, inside Rikers, then you can start to have programs where you train people. Now, I'm not saying, you know, if you do, if you do the crime, you got to do the time, but you want to give them skills so they don't have to come back out and, and start the same process all over again where they re-victimize people. So, you know, I would tie maybe early release, and I'm not talking about the violent career criminals. They need to serve their time. They need to be segregated, like Curtis said, keep the gangs from communicating because they run the prisons. But the, the your low-level offender, you know, you start them off with training, you give them a skill that they can come out, and they make themselves marketable, and you lower the recidivism rate. But you got to control it. What they want to do now, like you say, is it's, it's a blueprint for the rest of the country. They want to release these people back into the community like they did during the riots so that they can terrorize the community, make you fearful. They totally violate our Second Amendment rights, so you can't protect yourself because you can't carry a firearm. Not, not New York City. So the only people that have firearms are the career criminals and the police who've lost their qualified immunity. And right now you have police officers in the state. And I, I'm a former military policeman, so I know something about law. Without qualified immunity, a police officer cannot do his job. Because now he's subject to having his livelihood taken, his family, his kids, you know. So a police officer is probably going to just be a witness, like a security camera, and write up the report. Because if he gets involved and applies the lawful, justifiable force needed to protect the citizen, he's subject to a lawsuit. Meanwhile, politicians like Eric Adams and Bill de Blasio have not, not qualified immunity. They have absolute immunity to stand up there and lie. And, and to create these mandates and other unconstitutional policies that violate our rights. And guess what? There's never any accountability for it. They should, they should be investigated and incarcerated for civil rights violations. Not only that, I mean, you have Mayor de Blasio, the, the communist that he is. His wife stole, what, $888 million that can't be accounted for, and yet nothing has happened? It's truly stunning. And so when you look at all these policies, because something that nobody's really factoring in is the fact that in the most vulnerable areas, the most vulnerable kids have essentially been out of school for the last year and a half with the lockdowns, with the coronavirus. New York City schools were not really in person almost all last year. Some of them may have gone in for a couple of days. But in the most vulnerable communities, we took the most vulnerable people and basically threw them out on the street, shut down the schools. And now this is only going to exacerbate that situation. When it comes to the education system, the education system has collapsed throughout the United States, particularly in the urban areas. How do you intend to try and get that back on track? Well, I think what you have to have in everything is accountability. And if you look at the lady up in Putnam County, a good friend of mine knows her person. Her name is Tatiana Ayubrahim. And she lit that board of education up and I was inspired. I'm like, wow, <laughs> fire. You know what I'm saying? I mean, she's obviously either a police officer or related to a police officer. And they're going in there with this critical race nonsense. A little bit of background about me. I was a foster kid. My parents are white. You know, I'm a Catholic. I don't believe in this critical race theory. I don't want that taught to my kids. But we have no say in that, in anything. You know, you have a, a guy, like you say, on a national level, we have a guy running for governor, Terry McAuliffe, that actually said, Parents have no business telling the schools what they teach their kids. What ludicrous nonsense. But my plan for that is to revamp the Board of Education. And you know, I'm going to catch heat for this. It's going to be an uphill battle. It's going to be tough. If I get elected, we're going to get this done. You, you revamp the Board of Education so you have a Board of Education in each borough elected by the citizens of the borough with a commissioner overall reporting to the mayor, but elected by the citizens of the borough in an off year so that you have accountability. You can go in and you can tell the Board of Education, look, this is the curriculum we want, and we don't want critical race theory, which is it's just wrong on so many levels. Um, 
but this is these are the programs we want. This, we want our teachers teaching reading, writing, arithmetic, and civics. So we have people that know their rights and they're well prepared to work the jobs that I'm going to create. But this nonsense about critical race theory and, and all the other indoctrination, and now we have a generation of teachers that are indoctrinated. And, and guess what? On the way out the door, just to be a nasty person, Bill de Blasio is going to get rid of the gifted and talented program. You know, I'm a strong proponent of charter schools, vouchers, and homeschooling because that creates competition, which spurs efficiency. You know, if you decide to homeschool, that's going to increase the value of a teacher's salary because they're going to be sought after. And you can have that mixture of uh, online, in person, or in the home, but the teacher will be able to divide their time and they'll be able to impart that knowledge. And parents are going to pay. You know, we, we spent 27000 it used to be twenty two, twenty seven thousand dollars $27,000 a year to graduate illiterate kids. No, put that on the free market. But if Isn't that parents, amazing? It's I mean, crazy. It's astounding when you look at that number. $27,000 per student per year. That's per year, not throughout the student's educational career. And yet students are performing under a 22% proficiency level. To, to me, that it speaks volumes. And yet... <laughs> Nobody seems to be paying attention. Now, you do have an uphill battle because it, it is New York City. And so as far as getting the turnout, how, how do you anticipate trying to get people to actually go to the polls to vote? Early voting has already started. And then the tricks that the Democrats play within the system itself, where they try and, you know, I don't want to say with, with the mail apps and ballots, what they do is. They'll go around, they'll help people fill them out. When they put the polling boots in the tenements, in the apartment complexes, they'll walk the people downstairs. How do you try and get around that? Well, I got to get out in the street, which I've done. I've been up to Queensbridge, Ravenswood, all the way down to my neighborhood in Woodside. I'm going to be there on uh, Saturday. Um, early voting starts for us uh, at LaGuardia. I have some volunteers now. You know, I, I feel a lot better about this campaign, which is probably why um, my opponent won't debate me. We were able to get some billboards up. So we've gotten some early messaging out there throughout the month of October. And we're going to have volunteers stationed at these polling sites, um, handing out our literature, contrasting me with my opponent. But also we're going to have poll watchers. So I'm, we're going to have a meeting tonight um, where we're going to train people to watch the polls. But it's also important in how you gather evidence. You have to get, gather evidence that you can square out an affidavit or a deposition and get it in the court. And so we're going to train my people that when they notice an irregularity, they need to go not complain to the um, the poll workers themselves because, number one, a lot of them are told what to do and they're probably going to be in on it. Um, I used to be an AD poll monitor, and I'm not knocking the site coordinators, but they don't have a whole lot of power, and they're politically appointed. You know, it's a patronage position for the day. Um, complain to that police officer. Swear out a complaint. Um, that's why the police officer was there. So we want documented evidence, evidence that we can get into court. So if if we say that, you know, we observe the irregularity, number one, that we, we want to complain about fraud, um, we want to complain about our civil rights being denied, and we want to complain about theft, that also has to write out a complaint. And I'm not putting, I love NYPD. I was a former military policeman. My cousin retired OCB in Harlem, um, worked, worked on narcotics over there. But um we can, we, they're there for that purpose. So let's use the police officer to get this evidence on the record. And if there's any irregularity later on down the road, we can take it to court. Now, hopefully they're honest, but I, I don't know because my opponent, she's not really campaigning. Um, you know, she's out there doing things like watching and posting on Facebook about the Indigenous uh, Day parade that she was in which is kind of an affront because if you look at why Columbus, and they do it on Columbus Day. Of course. <laughs> and if you look at why Columbus Day was founded, you know, you had some Italian-Americans that came here. She she touts about immigration. My wife came here as an immigrant and now a lawful citizen. Who grew up in Italy, by the way. Um, Asian, but she grew up in Italy. But it was Columbus Day was founded because Italian-Americans were lynched and killed by the Democrat Party. All right. So that's an affront to every Italian-American. She's doing stunts like that not really campaigning, not talking about the 39th Avenue bike lane debacle. Um, debacle. Um, you know, so it kind of makes you think, wow, does she know something? Do they have an October surprise for me or whatever? But well, I don't know. We'll see. One of the October surprises may be the fact that we are now getting reports that some of the many of the migrants that are coming in through the southern border are being flown into Westchester County Airport and being distributed throughout the state, including New York City. 
And, and so when we look at something like that, how much is that going to tax the resources of the city and hurt American citizens that are there? Well, it, it's, it's bananas. You know, I mean, it's absolutely insane. Nothing done in the dead of night is legal, yeah, right? moral, and above board. You know, but they're going to have it. What they're doing is they're, they're using it. All right, let's be clear about that. They're creating, you know, Eric Adams just debated Curtis last night, and he said that he's going to keep this city a sanctuary city. You know, so instead of giving the immigrant a fair shake, instead of saying, if you love somebody, give them parity, but you do it lawfully. My wife immigrated here lawfully. My biological father immigrated here lawfully. They became citizens, and they enjoy the full richness of being an American. But, you know, he's talking about these illegal basement dwellings or yeah, illegal basement dwellings where we lost four people in my name when they drowned. Well, he's exacerbating that situation. He's going to continue that situation if he's elected. Why do these people have to live in constant squalor? You yeah. know, and so you're, you're going to build a permanent subclass of people that are going to be resentful to the people abusing them. Teach them to read, write, and speak English so they know what people are saying about them and so that they, they can become lawful citizens. Now, if I get elected, I'm going to have a section in my office that helps people become lawful citizens. If that requires a touchback, so they go back and they do it the right way and they come in. But once they have that full parity, they can look somebody in the eye and say, I don't need you to advocate for me. I understand everything that person said about me. And I know what it takes to get a job and keep a job. A lot of immigrants are good people and they work hard and they have a great ethic, but they're being encouraged to violate the law. And that's got to stop. A nation without borders is not a nation. I served 22 years of my life in the United States Army and I do it all over again because I love the Army. But we, you know, we have to have a secure border. Iraq has more of a secure border and more of a secure voting system. We need thumbprint ID. Isn't that scary? It's crazy. It's scary. But We're it's actually it's building small. walls in other countries, including Jordan and Egypt and other countries. We're paying for the funding of building walls. And yet here in the United States, we can't do that because the powers that be don't care. That That's what it comes down to. I mean, let's yeah. be honest here. If we put a law in place that any migrant that comes into the United States has to be put in the wealthy elite zip codes, I could guarantee you we'd have a wall within the next week. But because they send these people into the communities that are already suffering, where the infrastructure is already crumbling, they don't care because it's not affecting them and they could get cheap labor. In any event, Marvin, where can people find you? They can find me at MarvinJeffcoat.com, MarvinJeffcoat.com. That's my uh, website. They can find me on Facebook at uh, Marvin Jeffcoat, and they can find me on Twitter at Marvin R. Jeffcoat. And we're going to have links up at the PAS Report, so make sure you check it out, PASReport.com. Marvin, I really appreciate you coming on today. Enjoyed the conversation. I hope to have you back. Hopefully you could have success in this race and start taking back New York City because that's what needs to be done. Nick, it's been a pleasure. I look forward to working with Vicky and Curtis and talking to you again about our successes next time around. Absolutely. This is what it's all about, folks. Less than two weeks left. It's time we get active, we get involved. It's not necessarily just about complaining. Remember, nothing in life is easy. And we can't keep believing things are going to change simply because we complain or we, and we sit on the sidelines and do nothing. We, we need to support real candidates who understand the notion of serving the people. And that's why I wanted to talk to Marvin. If we can win seats in New York City, if we could win this city back, I could guarantee you, we could win seats throughout the country. I could guarantee you there'll be a massive change. And, and while the Republican Party as a whole may have abandoned a lot of these areas, we're seeing the real leaders emerge like Marvin and Vicky Paladino and Curtis Lewa and so many others that are building out real grassroots movement. So make sure you go support them. Check out the links. I got the links up at the PAS Report. Before I go, don't forget to give the PAS Report a five-star rating. Take 30 seconds to write a review on any podcast platform that allows it. Always helps. And share this episode with your family and friends. I got a great interview lined up for Monday. General Keith Kellogg is going to be here. Uh, it will be an amazing discussion, so make sure you tune in. I want to thank you for joining me. Stay safe, and I'll be back next week. Thank you for listening to the PAS Report Weekly Roundup Podcast. Podcast. Have a good one. Bye. Bye. Be sure to rate, share, and subscribe to the podcast so you'll never miss an episode. Also, visit PASReport.com and follow us on Twitter at PAS Report. 